into your glorious day. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Sing about what we all needed. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. A chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. And you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you're And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude, right? I could sing this song As I often do Every song must end But you never do So I throw my hands and Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I but I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a horse singing hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide Lord, I will worship you Yeah, so I put my hands And praise you again and again So that I For a horse singing hallelujah,
Oh, come on, my son. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your voice. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my son. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your son. Cause you've got a lion inside. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. All that I have is a high And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else before. Except for. 
God above it all. Hallelujah, God unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, have done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive, you break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, we can alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Yeah! Lord, we thank you for the great things you're about to do. We thank you for this time of worship. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Can you hear me? All right, everybody give a round of applause for Chris, Don, Angel, Judah, and Caleb. Man, it's nice to get a uh, full group of guys out here. I need that uh, music stand, so. But... Uh, Hey, before we get started, I do have a few announcements for you. So uh, if you would, Pete, flip over to our first one. Who likes to go camping? Me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So June 6th through the 8th, we've got a family camp out at Lake Silverwood. Uh, we got a group camp out there. You can bring a tent. You can bring a camper. You can bring an RV, whatever you got to camp in. We are going to group together. Uh, so far, there's about 40 people signed up. Um, the more, the merrier. I got up to 80 spots. If I can fill like another 20 spots or so, we're going to have enough money to, uh, to cook some carne asada up in the mountains and have a meal or two together. So I need more people to sign up for this event. You can sign up online or you can sign up out on the courtyard on uh, Sunday. And it's $20 for adults, $10 for kids, and that includes two nights of camping and all kinds of fun and fishing and, and whatever, hiking, whatever you like to do, we're going to do it together. Uh, there will be a couple of devotions up there. And so please, please, please sign up. We need more people to go. Amen? Amen. All right, and the next announcement. Men's Summer Study. It's coming up on June 25th. Uh, it's going to be here in the Fellowship Hall from 6.30 to 8. And we are going to be going through Pastor Mark's book, The Man Code. Anybody have a copy of it? All right. So if you got a copy, make sure you bring your copy. Uh, we're going to be going through two chapters every week. It's 12 chapters in all. Do I have a question? What? 7 to 8.30. Oh, 7 to 8.30. Yeah. 7 to 8.30. That's right. I don't know where I was coming from. P.M. <laughs> 7 to 8.30. That's the time. I was all wrong. I was all wrong. 7 to 8.30. And uh, you can sign up at that table back there. And if you need a man code book, we will have them available for you. So please sign up. It's going to be a great study, and it's going to be six weeks from June 25th through July 30th. Last announcement. Who's been to a men's retreat before? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, this one is September 27th through the 29th. We're going to start sign-ups 
in June. I just want to get you guys prepared for it and let you know that it's going to be $220 per person this year. Uh, the price went up slightly, but I did have them agree to upgrade the food this time. So we got a food upgrade. And uh, it's uh, Friday through Sunday. It's going to be a great time. We titled it Grounded. And it's all about being grounded in Jesus Christ, being grounded in the faith, being grounded in the word, and being grounded in heaven. Amen? All right, so guys, sign up. Uh, it's going to be the first Sunday in June is when we are going to start the sign-ups. So, and we'll also have sign-ups online for that. And uh, that is the last of my announcements. So if we could flip over to the first screen. And uh, we are going to be in the book of Judges this afternoon. Um, can you believe that four years ago, we were in the book of Judges in the men's Bible study. And uh, so I was going through some of that stuff, and, and I was looking at the beginning of chapter 3 where we're introduced for the first, to the first judge in the book of Judges. And man, I dug some great stuff out of there that really applies to us today. Uh, if you remember, the, uh, the series was, if you were here four years ago, and you were at the study, it was titled, Being Godly in an Ungodly World. Are we living in an ungodly world today? Man, I'm telling you. But uh, the book of Judges gives us some great uh, insights on how to live in the world that we are living in today. And so just for a little background information, uh, the book of Judges basically is the period that goes between the death of Joshua. In fact, twice at the beginning, it says after Joshua's death. And so that's where it begins. And then it goes through a series of judges who start off really well, but then kind of get more and have more and more issues with life as they, as they go through. And by the end of the book of Judges, man, the world is just a horrible place to live. And uh, so it ends uh, right before the birth of the very last judge, who is Samuel, who is the one who anointed both Saul as king and then David as king. So today, we're going to take a look at the very first judge. His name is Othniel. And you know what Othniel means? It means Lion of God. Now, what... Who, whose name does that remind you of? Man, it reminds you of Jesus, right? And so Othniel is the first judge who saved Israel. And so basically, the book of Judges is a series of flawed, imperfect human judges who could, who could save for a temporary amount of time, but they're all designed to point to our true our true Savior, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, so we're going to start in chapter 3. And just so you know, the first two chapters are where the Israelites say they've struggled. Um, they've struggled to take the promised land that God promised them, right? And uh, so there's various tribes already in the land, the Canaanites, and Judah, uh, Judah and the rest of the tribes they're unable to completely take possession of certain areas of the land. And so they make various excuses like, oh, this tribe had, had chariots of iron. We couldn't kick them out. Or this tribe was very stubborn. We couldn't completely remove them from the land. And so as we get to chapter 3, that's kind of the thing we're going through. Uh, some of these tribes, uh, Israel makes covenants with them, Right? They make covenants so that the people become a labor force for Israel. And that is in direct disobedience to God who told them to make no covenants with these people. And so instead of complete victory, what we end up with is partial victories because they are unable to completely take all the land that God promised. 
And so if you find yourself in your own personal life with partial victories instead of complete victories in your spiritual battles, then Judges is pointing us to ask ourselves, where in my life am I being disobedient? And so we're going to open up to chapter 3, but uh, I'm going to read the first six verses. Before we do that, why don't we go to the Lord in a word of prayer? Father, we come before you this afternoon, God, and we want to uh, lift up your word uh, this morning. Lord, we ask for your insight, your teaching. Um, We thank you that you've uh, given us your word, the Old and the New Testament. Lord, it shows us how to live. And here in Judges, especially how to live in a world like was then, which is much like the world of today. So, Lord, give us wisdom, give us understanding. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I'm going to read Judges chapter 3, the first six verses. Is everybody there? Yep. All right. God's word says this. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. And these are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And so the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And so, let me start by saying this. You know, when people turn from the true and living God, what they do is they begin to serve the gods of those who are all around them. Didn't we read that in the last verse? And so the question arises in my mind, what does it look like to worship all these little g gods, right? Not the big G, the little g gods. What does it look like to worship them? What does it look like to commit idolatry? You know, idol worship for the people of Canaan, it involved going uh, before their little statues or their, their images, whether it was wood or metal, it was a carved image or a molded image, an idol, uh, whatever you wish to call it, what they did was they entered into a, a process of negotiation with their idol. You offer something, a sacrifice, if you will, and then in turn you expect something back from your idol. When we worship an idol, what we are really doing is we're trying to stay in complete control of our lives. Because if I give something and I expect something in return, that puts me in control. And so we give the idol, we give him our money, we give the idol our time, we give the idol our attention. And then in return, we expect things like like pleasure or power or happiness or likes on Facebook if your God happens to be one that you carry in your in your pocket like this. Right? And so it has nothing to do with loving submission, but it has everything to do with manipulation. Worship of an idol involves a technique or a ritual. And so what you do is if I do this for my idol, then this will be the result. You know, sometimes we can even treat the Lord our God that way, right? You know, if I do this for God then he will in turn save me from some situation in my life 
or he will bless me with this particular blessing. And so we enter into a a negotiation process with God. I did that when I first got saved. Um, I remember after I got saved, um, and just so you know, I was a drug addict, which caused me to lose my job. And so when I lost my job, I filed for unemployment. My employer contested my unemployment. And so I had a a phone interview or a sort of a phone court date set up to determine whether I was going to get my unemployment or whether I wasn't. And so what I did was being a new Christian, I thought, well, you know what? If I go down in an altar call again for the second time, maybe God will see how serious I am and he will give me my unemployment. And that was my thinking process. God, however, had other plans. <laughs> I did not get my unemployment. Um, I did later go back to college, but that's a whole nother story. You know, too often, those of us who are immature in Christ tend to treat God as if he were an idol. You know, when we're going through something, when we're in need of deliverance, uh, we will put Je- we'll pull Jesus out of our back pocket and we will use him like, like he's a tool, like a tool that we carry around to fix the things that are broken in our lives. But when we truly enter into a relationship with the Lord, then we eventually learn that God, dem- what God demands from us is a heart surrender. And we can't use him as a bargaining chip or a negotiating tool. God's not like that, is he? And so, as the first uh, takeaway for this afternoon, I've got to turn this thing on first. Hey, there it goes. (laughs) The first takeaway for this afternoon is we can't make deals with God. Why? Because we have nothing to offer him, right? He doesn't need anything from us, does he? What he wants is a relationship with us. He wants our heart. And so the message is the tester and the tested. And it's important that we be reminded today just who is the tester and who is the tested. I think we all know by now, right? Who's the tester? It's God. Who... Who is being tested? It's us. God does the testing. We get tested. And so at the beginning of chapter 2, in verses 2 and 3, basically the Lord tells Israel that they have not obeyed his voice, right? And therefore, he says, I am not going to drive the Canaanites Canaanites out from before you. And so he's, God's going to make it hard for him. And what is, this, what is this, the reason for this? It's the reason is their disobedience, but also another reason is that God is testing them, right? So the Bible teaches that Canaanites remain both because of disobedience and for the purpose of testing. And for the Israelites here in, in Judges, having the presence of an enemy that is opposed to God it meant, it's meant to make them think about their own relationship with the Lord. It's meant, to, it's meant for them to consider their own failures and consider the wisdom of God's ways and to know that, that God's ways should separate them from the worldly culture that existed around them. But instead of separating themselves, they were joining with the culture around them. And so God wants them to separate themselves, not because they're a better people, but because they're his chosen people. And so ultimately, God is testing the obedience of his people. And for us and for them, the reason for the testing is that we would learn to have dependence upon God for all of our needs, right? For every situation, we will find that that as Christians, we are going to pass 
some tests of obedience and other tests of obedience, we're going to fail. But the truth is we all get graded on the same standard. And that standard is his will and his word. That's what we're graded upon. You know, perhaps you did something or, or said something or even thought something that dinged your own conscience, right? Well, just know that there's a test in there somewhere. Uh, maybe you, you read your Bible during the day and you were convicted by something you read in there. Just know that there's a test coming on that. And so whether we pass or fail is not going to determine our ultimate destination, right? That's not the end of the story. And why is the second takeaway for today? And it's related to uh, Romans 8 verse 1 where, where the Apostle Paul writes that there is thou, now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And therefore the takeaway is this. God doesn't grade on a curve. God grades on his son. Amen? Okay. And so the second reason for testing, it's given in verse 2. And it says this. It was only in order that the generation of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. And so the next reason for God's testing is that they would learn how to fight, right? They were, it was to teach them war. And so God doesn't just want his special people to learn obedience through testing them. He wants them to become warriors, right? You know, they're surrounded by dangerous neighbors. And it would be necessary for future generations of the Israelites to know war. You know, Israel has existed in a hostile environment for most of her entire history. Is that not true? Back then, it was the Philistines. It was the Canaanites. It was the Hittites. It was the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Moabites. And they were all parasites, right? <laughs> and then after that, it would become the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and so on. Um, military ability from a human perspective has always been needed for Israel's survival. It was true back then, and I don't know if you've noticed, but it is certainly true today as well. Since Israel was miraculously reestablished as a nation in 1948, Israel has had to fight for her survival every single day. Today's enemies are so-called Palestinians, right? It's Hamas, it's Hezbollah, it's Iran, it's Lebanon. Even Jordan and Turkey are turning into her enemies. In fact, it is soon becoming that the whole world is turning against Israel. And it's a tiny nation. You know, I, I brought up an image. <clears throat> See that little tiny piece of red right in the middle of your screen? That's Israel. And they want to divide it up, right? They want to give half of it away. In fact, the people that they want to give half of it away to, they don't want just half of it. They want the whole thing, right? And you look at all these nations around them, and one by one, they're turning into Israel's enemy. <clears throat> but God promises to Israel this, and it's through the prophet Isaiah. And it's in chapter 54, the first part of verse 17 says, No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. And so it's not a promise that Israel wouldn't be attacked or that no weapon would have any effectiveness against them. But it's a promise that those weapons wouldn't prosper in the end, right? They wouldn't have victory over Israel because behind all of it, the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen? So 
Did you know that God teaches each one of us as well for the purpose of teaching us warfare? Spiritual warfare, right? And just like Israel, God often uses the people around you in order to test you. Sometimes it's your friends. Sometimes it's your family members. It could be your boss at work. It could be your co-workers. It could be the person who cuts you off in the freeway. It could be the people commenting on your Facebook post. Woke people in the supermarket. You know, for me, God's always using other people to, to, to test my patience. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have experienced that. And when I'm driving, God uses traffic signals to test my patience. And every, every time I seem to fail that test, I don't know what's going on. But, uh, <laughs> but God wants to teach you obedience and he wants to teach you discipline. Why? The next takeaway is this. The goal of training for warfare is to learn discipline. And so... In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, the Apostle Paul says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. We don't want to be disqualified, do we? <clears throat> of course we don't. But, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was an undisciplined person fighter. And God always used my brother to test me and to train me to be a better fighter because he was older than me. And when we were little kids, he would chase me around the house and I would end up just jumping on the bed and then he would grab a pillow and smother me until I couldn't breathe. And then when I, when I got up the guts to start fighting him back, I was so undisciplined what I would do is I would start swinging my arms in a helicopter motion and then I would run at him and he would just wait and time it and boom, sock me in the face and down I went. <laughs> it took me a while to learn not to do that. That is undisciplined. We don't just beat the air, I think Paul says. But uh, God tests our obedience so that we would learn discipline through our spiritual battles. Obedience and discipline always lead to spiritual growth, and spiritual growth will help equip us in the full armor of God. You know, the armor of God, it will help you deal with those Canaanites in your life. And this will hone your skills to, re to resist all those temptations that come from the enemy of our souls the devil. When we resist his temptations, we are now in a position to battle with our own most stubborn enemy. You know who that is? It's you. It's yourself. It's us. It's the lust of the flesh. It's the lust of the eyes. It's the pride of life. And the full armor of God shouldn't just protect you from the devil. It should protect you from yourself. And uh, because I throw more fiery darts at my own head than the devil ever tosses at me. I'll tell you that's the truth. But uh, I'm going to reread verse 6 and then we're going to move on. Because I've already gone over time, I think. I don't know. Um, verse 6 said, And their daughters they took to themselves. So uh, Israel's taking Canaanite daughters and giving them to their sons and then they're taking their own daughters and giving them to the sons of the Canaanites. And then it says, and they served their gods, not the big G, but the, their little G gods, their little molded images, molded and carved images that they were worshiping and making sacrifices to. That's what, e that's what Israel began to serve. And so what happens next? Let's read verses 7 through 11. And the people of Israel did what was right, did what was, I'm sorry, 
did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years, and then Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. The Lion of God, he died at the end of the book. And so in the book of Judges, there's a cycle that takes place. And so you'll notice at the beginning of this, we see that Israel rebels, right? And then God punishes Israel by sending Cushan Rishathaim, and he, they are like enslaved to him for eight years. And then Israel cries out to God, and then God has mercy, and he appoints a judge. And then the judge delivers Israel, and then in the end, Israel has temporary peace. And throughout the book of Judges, this cycle is repeated over and over and over again. Uh, another generation rises up who doesn't know the Lord. And so they rebel by doing evil in God's sight, and they go through this whole cycle. And we read at the beginning that they forgot their Lord the God. They forgot their God the Lord. And when it says here that they forgot, it doesn't mean that they no longer knew who God was or what he had done what it's saying and what it means is that they were no longer controlled by what they knew. And therefore, God was no longer real to them, right? Is God real to you? You know, the same problem exists in the church today. It's the reality of a true and living God. It tends to become head knowledge for us, right? And when that happens, when our relationship with the Lord becomes just an intellectual thing, when his word no longer grabs our attention, when it no longer penetrates our heart, when it no longer controls our actions, then why did, why did Israel forget the Lord? Why did they forget the Lord? Why? Because God is invisible, right? They could see and touch the idols that were all around them. They could see and touch the carved and molded images. But they couldn't see and they couldn't touch God. You know, the problem is the same today. I can see and I can touch my car. I can grab hold of my money. I can pull out my credit card. I can, feel the, I can feel the experience of control. I can, I can feel power. I can know pleasure. And so what happens is those things become more real to us than God, right? And so we begin to serve these other gods. You know, Hebrews 10, 24, it says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Um, we know God is real because we experience fellowship together, right? I can see God in other people in the way they act, the way they've been transformed in their lives, I can see God in myself because my life has been transformed. I like how, uh, how, it, how it's explained in 2 Peter. 
chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and it starts, it starts with make every e- effort to supplement your faith. Supplement it with what? Supplement it with virtue, and then knowledge, and then self-control, and then steadfastness, and then godliness, and then brotherly affection, and finally, love. You know, it's that agape love, that sacrificial love that we have for one another that demonstrates to ourselves and demonstrates to others that this invisible God that we worship is real. And so then 2 Peter uh, verse 12, uh, the apostle says this. He says, therefore, in fact, I put it on the screen for you says, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. And so the takeaway there is this. Instead of forgetting, like the Israelites in the book of Judges, let's remind each other and remember what God has done in our lives and continues to do to this very day. We need to be reminded of the things that we already know, right? And that makes the truth come alive in our hearts as well as in our heads. And so God gets angry with Israel and he sells them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim, who's the king of Mesopotamia. And they serve him for eight years. They didn't want to serve God And so God gave them someone to serve, right? And his name translates from Hebrew into this. It's Kushan of double wickedness. That's what his name means. What were his parents thinking when they gave him that name? (laughs) It's like some comic book villain's name, right? (laughs) Kushan, not Kushan the wicked, but Kushan the double wicked. And so as bad as that name is, Scripture clearly points to us here that Kushan is not the one in charge of this situation, but God is the one directing all of this for His purpose. And that purpose is to test their obedience and to train them for warfare. And it's also to bring about repentance which is what we see in 7 through 11. And once they show repentance, what does God do? That's when he, they cry out to the Lord. You remember that? They cry out in repentance. That's when God sends the deliverer. And so eight years seems like a long time to suffer, doesn't it? Like it took them eight years to cry out to the Lord. Man, that's crazy. But then I think of my own life, and I know that, I was a methamphetamine, a methamphetamine addict for over 20 years, like 23 years. It took me 23 years to finally cry out to the Lord. So eight years no longer seems all that bad, right? I think that it's important to note here that the only thing that any one of us ever contributes to our rescue, to our deliverance, is to cry out to God and to place our complete dependence in his hands. Every judge in the book of Judges, except Othniel, as you go through this, has some sort of uh, flaw or brokenness about him. They are flawed and broken saviors. Except for Othniel. You don't really read anything flawed or broken about him, do you? And so the true purpose of the book of Judges, as I said earlier, is to point us to our one and only true Savior, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to kind of finish by discussing the similarity between Othniel and Jesus, and then we'll, we'll point out the obvious and glaring difference. And so I already said Othniel's name means Lion of God. Jesus is the Lion of Judah, right? But Othniel is the only judge in the book that, de- with, that has details actually written about him, but no flaws or sins are mentioned in those details. Now, we can be sure 
that he did have flaws, right? Why? Because he's a man, right? We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so in the end, it's not really the similarities that point us to Jesus, but it's the differences. And so although it says in verse 9 that Othniel delivered them, we know that the true deliverer here is God. And the most glaring difference between, between them is that Othniel is a man and Jesus Christ is our Lord. He was both man and God, right? 100% man, 100% God. Othniel was 100% man. End of story. And so when Othniel delivered, verse 11 says that the land had rest for 40 years. There was peace in the land for 40 years. You know, when Jesus saves, he also brings peace into our lives, right? No longer is God our enemy, but we are now part of God's family. But it's not for 40 years, right? It's for ever. Why is Jesus' peace permanent and Othniel's only temporary? Well, the answer is at the end of verse 11. What does it say? Here, let me turn back there. It basically says that Othniel died, right? So, Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. That's the exact scripture. That's the end of his story, right? But with Jesus... What do we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4? It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance that, that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He died, but then he was raised again on the third day. That's the difference between Othniel and and between Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 15 goes on to give us these verses. And if Christ is not risen, your faith, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men the most pitiable. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the final takeaway is Jesus saves because he lives. And so at the beginning, we ask this question, do you find yourself with only partial victories in your spiritual battles? And did you know that our God is a jealous God? Do you know that? He's not jealous of the devil. He's not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. He wants all of us, not just some of us, right? And so I think we find that if we are having partial victories, it's because we're showing partial obedience, right? What is partial obedience? It's disobedience. And so, you know, God wants all of you. He doesn't want some of you. I think uh, probably everyone here wants to go to heaven. Right? We all want to go to heaven. But are we prepared to meet a righteous God when we get there? Are you prepared? The only way to be prepared is to be obedient. You know, we all love God's promises in the Bible, but do we love his commandments? David did, and that's what we're to do too. And I think if you, if you go from partial obedience to true obedience, if you do, if you read God's word and then you do what it tells you to do, then you will find 
that your partial victories become greater and greater. We're still going to have failures, right? All of us are going to have failures. And the truth is, is you're probably going to learn more out of your failures than you ever will out of your victories. But God wants to give you victory in those spiritual battles over your sin. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Um, thank you for these men who came out to enjoy this, uh, this food, to enjoy the worship. Um, God, <clears throat> Psalm 150, the last psalm in the book of Psalms, says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, God, let us go out praising you today. In Jesus' name, amen.